Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to share a dream with you that I had this past weekend, Sunday morning. Um, you know, usually, uh, not always, but many times, what I'm dreaming just as I'm waking up um, seems to have purpose. It has a message to it. And so I had this, this dream, you know, right at daylight on Sunday morning of Catherine Kuhlman. Uh, who was kind of one of the champions that God has used over the years to speak to me and kind of mold some of my perspective of what uh, what I believe that we will see in the last days. And uh, she had a prophetic word, really. She was It was not a dialogue, it was a monologue. She was the only one doing talking. She was talking and I was listening, which was good with me. But uh, the message had two points, two points to her dream, to the dream. And I'd like to share those with you as an encouragement. To do that, I need to share just a little bit of history to understand the perspective of the dream. But uh, some years ago, I was waiting on the Lord, about four years ago, just waiting on the Lord like I do, you know, very often and trying to quiet the soul and listen to the Holy Spirit. And I heard a voice, internal voice say to me, what ministries have most influenced who you are and what you carry and what you believe? And immediately I knew the answer to that question. So I said, William Branham and Alexander Dowie and Catherine Kuhlman and, and uh, John G. Lake and, and Mariah Woodworth Etter and A.A. Allen. I named six names right off the bat. And then a voice said to me, well, how many letters are in their name? You know, I had never thought about that. Never put any consideration to such a thing as that, you know. So I thought, well, William Branham, that's 14 letters. Alexander Dowie, that's 14 letters. That's interesting. Catherine Kuhlman, my goodness, that's 14 letters also. So I'm getting kind of excited now, you know. Then I, I come to Mariah Woodworth Etter. Then I thought, oh, there goes the 14 number because that's more than 14. But as surely as I'm sitting here, a voice spoke inside of me and said, but she was only Mariah Woodworth when I commissioned her. And of course, we pronounce it, they pronounced the name Mariah, but it was actually spelled like we would say Maria. Maria or Mariah Woodworth, 14 letters. I was shocked. Then I came to John G. Lake and I wasn't sure what the G stood for in his name, so I looked it up on the internet and sure enough, John Graham Lake, 14 letters. And then I come to A.A. A. Allen, had no idea what the initials A.A. A. stood for. I had to look it up, I had his biography there. So I looked up his name, A.A. A. Allen, Asa Alonzo Allen, 14 letters. I was shocked, I was shocked. All, all the ones that were given to me that day, there was one more that was given later, but all those had 14 letters in them. And that had a lot of meaning to me. And I don't have time to go into that in this blog, maybe another blog will talk about the significance of that. But to me, it relates to, to Paul. Um, Paul, you know, uh, the number 14 is closely connected to his ministry. And there's just a number of things that come from that. But it was just a fascinating fact that I, I had never thought about. And so each one of those that I just named presented some aspect of God's nature. They, they carried something that was of particular interest to me that I felt like at least God had used to mold my perspective of what to prophesy for the last days. And the thing, the number one thing from Catherine Kuhlman that was so significant to me way back in the early 90s, back in the early 90s, when I first started to study her life was the fact that she made this statement one time that the Holy Spirit was her best friend. The Holy Spirit was her best friend. And I began to investigate that a little bit and I began to find out that she lived in a state of constant and continual fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul prayed one time that the love of God the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And she literally lived in a state of constant communion, constant fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You might say, what did that look like? Well, I remember one time she was asked, well, how many hours do you pray before a great healing crusade? You know, most people are thinking, you know, we've got this healing meeting coming up. Surely she'll go into a closet somewhere and pray for two and a half hours in emergency tongues to get the anointing so she could go out and do the healing service. And her answer was surprising. She said, I pray no more on the day of the healing service than I prayed yesterday and the day before and the day before. Not because she didn't believe in prayer, 
but because she lived in a state of constant communion, fellowship, friendship with the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. The story is told where after a great healing crusade at the Navy Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Roberts, uh, came up to Catherine Kuhlman after the service and said, you know, I really thought maybe we could have some dinner after the meeting tonight, but he said, I know what it's like to be under the anointing. I know how it drains the flesh, and you've been under the anointing for these three or four hours, and I'm sure that anointing has drained you physically, and so we don't have to go to dinner if you don't like. And she said, I'm, I'm fine. She said, I live under that anointing all the time. That struck me. That struck me that someone can live in a state of constant abiding presence. The Lord Jesus did. Of course, He was God, but I mean, He is our example. The Holy Spirit came upon Him the day He was baptized, and the Bible says, and it remained. I remember not too long ago, the Lord tweaked my understanding of His prayer life. I used to think, this was my human perspective, that, you know, here was the Lord, you know, the demands that he had on his life. Can you imagine all the sick people he prayed for? He would get up in the morning and preach and teach in the synagogues, praying for the sick and delivering the oppressed and just hours and hours and hours of ministry. And he would come to the end of the day and then the Bible would say he would go out and pray all night. And I used to think, wow, what, what dedication, what commitment, you know, to minister all day and then go pray all night long. And the Lord said, you have my prayer life completely misunderstood. He said, going out and pray was not my labor, it was my reward. He said, that's what I was waiting for all day long. And I had a little visionary encounter where I saw the Lord go out into the wilderness away from His disciples. And I watched Him as He released Himself into the presence of His Father. Yes, it was prayer, but it was fellowship. He came into the presence of His Father, and there was communion, there was relationship, there was times of refreshing that came from the presence of God for the Lord's literal fleshly body. There was this constant exchange. There was, a, there was the revelation. So His prayer life, you know, I began to understand my prayer life is not a labor, it's not a responsibility, it's my joy, it's my lifestyle, it's the culture of my life to begin to live in a state of fellowship. That's my goal. I'm not saying I've achieved it yet. But if there's one thing that I come away from the life of Catherine Kuhlman with, is she found that. She discovered that place in God. And that was point number one in my dream. Point number one in my dream was a reminder that there is a place in God where we can live in a state of constant communion, constant koinonia, constant fellowship. And I felt like it was even an invitation for right now. I really believe that. I believe there is an invitation for some of us right now to begin to enter into a place where our lifestyle, it's not just what we do, it's who we are. And that brings me to point number two in my dream. And this is where it got a little animated, but especially to hear Catherine Kuhlman talking to me the way she was talking to me in a very dramatic, animated way as she does. But then she was in a very forceful way. She said, you must eat the Word, and then vomit the Word. <laughs> and right when she said that, I, I came to myself. And I, I knew when she said that, I knew that was Revelation 10. Any of you that have watched our ministry at all, you know that Revelation 10 is kind of a cornerstone of what we believe. And I believe that's exactly what the admonition was that was given to John. He was told to take the little book that was open in the hand of the strong angel you know, and take it and eat it. He's, the angel said, come and take the book and eat it. It'll be bitter in your belly, but in your mouth, it'll be as sweet as honey. And John said, I went and I took the little book from the hand of the angel and I ate it and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. But when I had eaten it, it became bitter in my belly. And the angel said, and you must prophesy again concerning many nations, tongues, tribes, and kingdoms. So the, the idea there is that you eat something and it's not just going to, it's not just a word in your mouth that goes into your belly. If I could put it another way, I believe the Lord is calling us today and from now until the end of the age to not speak or preach or prophesy from our head, but from our belly. The Lord is not looking for more preachers. He's looking for messengers. He's not looking for more sermons. He's looking for people to deliver messages 
and point number two is directly related to point number one in my dream. Point number two happens when we live in a state of constant fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit becomes our best friend. And when that happens, we begin to eat the revelation of Jesus Christ and we prophesy from our belly because it's not going to stay in, it's coming out. <laughs> it's coming out. You become living epistles read of all men. I believe something's coming from God. I do. And I do believe those two points are significant. I believe they are keys. They are foundations for us to begin to apprehend what's coming. Because when you do that, what you say becomes living. It's the living word. It's the living word. A word that comes from the atmosphere of the anointing. A word that is not just something you've memorized. A word that is not just something you made notes about a word that comes out of your innermost being because you have a revelation of it. It is a part of who you are. One of the, one of the Hebrew words for prophesy is to spew out. And so there you have the idea. And it's clear what that's talking about. What is, what is John prophesying? It says it over in verse 7 of Revelation 10, the mysteries of God, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of redemption, the end time plan of God, the consummation of the ages things that have been hidden in God since the foundation of the world. That's what it says in Ephesians 3, that, that Paul said that things that have been hidden from men were now being revealed by his holy apostles and prophets. And there is, there is manna, there is revelation, there is strategy, there are mysteries reserved for this last day generation that are being apprehended and prophesied from that atmosphere of the anointing. So I hope that encourages you. I, I know it's speaking to the life and destiny of many of you that watch. That you can learn by the grace of God to cultivate a place of intimacy and fellowship with God where you live it 24-7. You know, I'm not there yet, but I, I, I don't do any more prayer on the day I do ministry than I do the day before because I want to live in that culture. I want it to be my lifestyle. I believe in intercession, but you know, intercession comes by inspiration. I can't go watch my watch and say, okay, it's nine o'clock, I'm gonna do some travail now. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> That's as much a impartation of the Holy Spirit as, the, as operating in the gifts of the Spirit. So, so when, you, when you are in prayer, sometimes something like intercession or travail will come upon you when you pray those things, but otherwise it's fellowship, it's communion. It's relationship. It's what the Lord Jesus did, releasing himself in the presence of his Father and enjoying the fellowship with his Father. But, you know, he didn't have to be transformed, but that place with us will transform us if we learn to release ourselves into the presence of God. We will be transformed and we will prophesy a living word. So I release that to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.